Good evening, good evening. I hope everybody's had a good day today. It's been a little rainy outside, but God's good. Amen. Um, tonight's lesson is difficulty uh, in the New Testament passages. And sometimes, have you ever, I know I have, read things and uh, I would say, Lord, what are you trying to say here? And I would have to go back and read a couple of times the same passage and ask the Lord, now give me some wisdom on this, some insight on this, to understand what the uh, the Word of God is saying to us. But So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, difficulty in New Testament passages. Uh, a lot of this lesson uh, has repetitive things that go over and over, so I won't do that. <laughs> I won't do that to you. But... Uh, it says, studying the Holy Scriptures uh, is highly rewarding, and it's a lifelong endeavor. Um, I know when I first got saved, I, I, I didn't have the desire at first to read, but as I began to re read God's Word, He gave me more and more of a hunger and a desire to read it. And uh, in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, we should be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth or applying what God's word um, wants us to do with our lives. So that's the reason we need to study so we can show ourselves approved. We want to be able to keep God's commandments and to do that, we have to understand his word. But And it says it's a lifelong endeavor. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the power of the Spirit of the Lord. And what does this mean with unveiled face? It means we're uncovered. The Holy Spirit sees us inside and out. And uh, as he looks into our inner man, into our heart, he will reveal things to us through his word as we study and pray. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us the things we need to change in our life. So we are bare before the Lord, unveiled face. Uh, the lesson overview. This lesson examines several New Testament passages of Scripture that raise questions that beg to be answered. Therefore, each major division of this lesson is presented under a heading that is, uh, that is a question posed by the Scripture passages under consideration. Before the invention of the printing, uh, of printing by Johanna Gutenberg in 1456, few people had Bibles because the cost of one hand-copied Bible, see, before they could do printing, People literally had to look at what a book said if they wanted to copy it, and word for word, they had to pin it by hand. They had to write it. So books were extremely expensive, especially Bible. Uh, Bible would be extremely expensive back in those days. And it said the cost of a hand-copied Bible was a year's wages for the average working man. Now today, you and I, if you're like me, you may have 8, 10, 12 Bibles in the house uh, because uh, even though they are somewhat expensive, they're not. Uh, it's not near as expensive as it was back then. Can you imagine having to spend a year's wages on the Word of God? Can I tell you, I, I think it would be a great investment, even if your man had to spend a year's wages. But how many men, honestly, would spend that kind of money? A lot of people would not have access to the Word of God today. Uh, so we, we have... It's abundant. We have it on radio. We have it on TV. We have access to it. We have copies of it in our home. You can take your phone now and pull up a Bible app. So many things make the Word readily available to us. It says, when printed copies of the Bible became available in affordable abundance, virtually everyone uh, who read the Bible became an interpreter of Scripture. And that's the reason you have so many different denominations today. Uh, number one, a lot of people, when they hear the word, even if it's being preached in truth, when they hear it, if the word offends their lifestyle, they have a tendency, uh, they want a couple of things. They either want the minister to try to change the word, which any minister in his right mind is not going to try to change God's word because 
It's unchangeable. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Or number two, if they can't get the man to compromise on that, then they want to leave and go to another church where maybe the interpretation uh, of that particular church or denomination is not as strong. And uh, that, that, that gets kind of scary too. That's the reason we have so many different people today that believe so many different things. And uh, so it says, uh, this created the need for finding the best answers uh, possible for scriptures that were difficult to understand. And I do believe this. I believe if we read the Bible and there's something we don't understand, we begin to pray and ask God. And Proverbs says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask it from the Lord who will give it liberally. So God does not want us to be in the dark on what he wants or expects out of our life. He wants to reveal to our spirit and our mind what he wants us to live through his word. Uh, let's look at the lesson outline. What is divine election? And there's two parts to this first outline. The election in historical context. Uh, and if you go back and look in the Old Testament especially, it's all by God's will, just like he preferred, God preferred Jacob over Esau. Even before they were born, they struggled when they were coming out of the womb. And the whole time it was the plan of God. God already knew but uh, it's by God's will. And uh, the second part is election in Christian context. Again, it's God's people being chosen as he wills. Do you know Saul, uh, the people wanted a king. So at that particular time, God gave them because it, 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 and everything is in timing. The Bible says that there's a time and a season and a purpose. God knew that David was coming but David wasn't ready right then, so the Lord, they wanted a king so bad, and the Lord said, hey, I'll give them what they want, what they're about to ask for, but before I do, tell them what's going to happen in the future. See, he said, tell them Saul is going to be a hard king. He's going to have a lot of taxes. He's going to take some of your sons, and they're going to serve him, and they're going to work it. And he was telling them all these awful things uh, that Saul was going to do way ahead of time before Saul was ever uh, elected as king. So uh, God knows what's going on right now with you. Uh, he knows what's happened in the past, and he also sees the future, and sometimes that blows people's mind, but God already knows what lies ahead for us. So uh, let's look uh, at Second Peter uh, one and ten, uh, chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. It says, this scripture is talking about being sure of your salvation. Now, there's some things in life that, uh, that you might can be wrong about. You may be uh, 10 minutes late for an appointment, or you may think that a football game uh, started at 5 o'clock and it starts at 7. Those are things that are not earth-shattering. They're not going to make a big difference in your life. But if you are not sure of your salvation and you die lost in your sins, that it... That, that's the most horrible thing. It said, the Bible says it would have been better for a man to have never been born. So the scripture tells us to make sure of our election, make sure of our salvation, make sure that we're walking in the will of God. Amen. Number two, who and what restrains the Antichrist? And there's two parts to this one. The man of sin, the Antichrist. And the scriptures tell us here, this particular set of scriptures in 2 Thessalonians tells us before Jesus comes, there will be a great falling away. Now, you hear a lot of preachers today talking about, oh, I believe a mega revival's coming. I believe this and I believe that. That's not what scripture says. Scripture says in the end of time, there will be a great falling away. And it says the Lord will even cut the time short lest the very elect those who were even focused on him. It said, lest the very elect would be deceived. And we are in a time of falling away. Uh, to, earlier today, somebody was asking me, said, why do you think it is? Uh, they had some friends that had fallen out of church that are not attending church anymore. And, and, and they said, why do you think it is that they're not coming to church anymore? I said, because they choose not to. We choose you, you, when you get up on Monday morning, you choose whether or not you want to be employed. If you if you want a paycheck at the end of the week, you make a choice on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. You get up and you go to work. 
Well, as a child of God, do you know God has requirements of us just like our job does, our public job does. God has requirements of us, and one of those requirements, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. God wants his people to be in his house, and he wants them to come and worship him. So the, serving the Lord is a choice. It's a, a conscience choice that we make. We have to want to serve the Lord. And, and so that's the first part here. And, and let's look at this next one here. Uh, it, it says um, that, we, again, we're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit, it says when Jesus comes, that uh, the spirit of the Antichrist will already be on the scene. Well, me and you, we feel something going on in the atmosphere today. Just look at the change that has taken place in our society since 2017, 18. Let's even go further than that. Let's look at the change that took place uh, since January of 2020. It's huge. Now, now think about that. That's only a year and three months ago, but look how much has changed with our society. Look how chaotic we've got in things. How things, the pendulum is swinging wild we never know what to expect from one day to another when we turn our TV set on. When you look at world news, we don't know what's going on from one moment to the next until, boom, it hits. That's because the earth is starting to tra uh, travail just like a woman in childbirth. We're seeing a spirit that is prevailing in earth. You know what causes all this discord, what brings about all these horrible feelings uh, between races and all this? It's the spirit of Antichrist. The Lord said he came so we'd have life and have it more abundant. He came so he wants to be our peace. He said, peace I give not as the world gives. I give a peace that passes all understanding. Well, today, if we don't have peace and we have utter chaos, guess who brought that? It wasn't the Lord. So we know the spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well. And it says, the second part says, we know not what they knew. What did they know? Uh, it was revealed even through the words of the prophet, even back in the Old Testament, what's restraining, what's keeping things in order right now, what's keeping uh, the devil from just running rampant. The church is still here. God's people are still here. The power of the Holy Spirit is literally restraining and holding things up. The earth is getting ready. We sense it, but it hadn't happened yet because God's Spirit is still keeping things at bay. Amen? And the third part of the outline says, can defectors be saved? And you can find these scriptures in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 and Romans 10. Uh, it's talking about, in all these uh, three sets of scriptures, it's talking about now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. But there's going to be a time that God winks at ignorance no more, but he expects all men everywhere to repent. But if men absolutely refuse to accept salvation... They absolutely refuse to accept the grace and the mercy of God. They are turned over to a reprobate mind. They're not even convicted anymore by the power of the Holy Spirit. People say, oh, I'm worried that I've blasphemed. If you're worried about it, friends, you hadn't done it because the, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be convicting you that you need to live better. So that conviction, thank God that he's still working with you. He's still uh, convicting you. And, 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 you know, you don't want to, uh, the Bible says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Today, people get so aggravated, they go to church, they hear the word, and the word offends them or cuts their flesh. They get mad. They get mad at the preacher. They get mad at the church. They get mad at their self, but they're not going to tell you that. But you know what they do? Instead of repenting and saying, God, thank you for working with me through the power of the Holy Spirit, they rebel. And if we're in rebellion, the Bible says rebellion is a form of witchcraft. So we want to make sure here uh, that we're not reprobates. We're not giving over to just following the devil. And some people today are. They're never. Have you ever seen people that showed up in a church, the power of the Holy Spirit's moving, people are worshiping everywhere? They sit there like a stone statue. They feel absolutely zero. That's a dangerous place to be. I would be on my face somewhere calling out, God, I don't feel your spirit, but please let me feel it again. Amen. And it says, but this is the way to salvation, Romans chapter 10, uh, 9 through 11, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart 
Uh, it says, for with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. That's the reason uh, years ago you would see this especially. People would go to the altar, they would pray through, they would be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. First thing they did was got up out of the altar, and the man of God would say, testify, tell us what the Lord has done. And they would open their mouth and they would say, I thank God for saving me, sanctifying me, filling me with the Holy Ghost. Because this scripture comes to life. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. We confess our sins and God, he hears that confession. He's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. The golden text, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, that is for teaching, for correction, instruction in righteousness. See, if we're a child of God and we believe that the word of God is the holy inspired word of the Lord, we believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, he moved on men and as he moved on them, that they pen the words, and these are the very words of God that we have today in the Bible. That's what we believe. Amen. So let's look at the teaching goals. To impart and reinforce knowledge, to carefully examine the scriptures to, dis to, uh, to the discovery of the most likely answers to the questions that they raise. To influence attitude, so we appreciate the fact that a superficial reading of Scripture may cause a person to jump uh, to the wrong interpretation of Scripture. Have you ever saw people that literally they read something? And um, I had somebody that told me recently, they said, well, the disciples said you only baptize in the name of Jesus. I said, yeah, but Jesus said, go ye therefore baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So if you really want to go that route, I'm going to think that Jesus holds precedence over what the disciples said or, or anybody, Peter or anybody else. If it came out of the mouth of Jesus, I want to do it the way that I've been instructed to do it. Amen? So uh, we need to be careful that we don't interpret the scriptures in the wrong way. Uh, and the last one is to influence our behavior, to impress on our minds that the correct understanding of scripture should lead us to the correct application of scripture in daily living. What, what is this saying, Pastor? The scripture says, be not only hearers of the word, but be ye also doers. If the scripture said, don't lie, don't go around lying. If it said, don't steal, don't steal. Don't go around stealing. Don't go around killing people because scripture said, don't kill. It's pretty simple. We read the scripture, and when the spirit reveals to us what the meaning of it is, we actually apply it to our life. That's living a victorious Christian lifestyle. Um, it says the historical literary background. All scripture for this lesson that were written by the apostles Paul and Peter with the exception of the passage from Hebrews, which since the early 20th century has been attributed to, the, to an author unknown, even though many people believe Paul wrote it. Uh, the apostle Paul wrote all of the 13 books in the New Testament attributed to him through A.D. 50 through 66, and the Apostle Peter wrote the two books or letters attributed to him in A.D. 64 and 65. Prior to the 20th century, the letter to the Hebrews was routinely attributed to the Apostle Paul with a general agreement that it was written between A.D. 63 and 65. We believe, amen, we believe, that the whole Bible is the Word of God with the New Testament being our rule for Christian faith and practice. That means not only do we believe in it and have faith in it, we want to practice what is in God's Word. We want to put it into action in our life. So let's go to, uh, let's go to Scriptures here for just a, a little bit. Uh, in Romans chapter 9, verse 9, it says, For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, you know, Sarah received a promise. Abraham and Sarah received a promise that they would have a son, that he would have somebody to leave an inheritance to. Every man wants that, amen? But you know, just like Sarah, don't we today sometimes, we feel like God has made promises to us. We want to see 
uh, uh, the, the things of God uh, come to life and, 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 and be moving in us actively. And you know what we do? We get in a hurry. Well, I thought, Lord, that you had called me to a ministry and it was going to be a great ministry and blah, blah, blah. And you know, we get in a hurry. We want to help God out. And this is what Sarah, uh, she got in a hurry to have the promise that God had made to her for a son. We all know what she done. She gave her young, uh, beautiful servant girl, Hagar, to Abraham, and, and they had a son, Ishmael, and today that's the reason you have the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac uh, fighting each other over in Jerusalem because somebody tried to get in a hurry and help God out and get ahead of his plan. See, she didn't have to get in a hurry, just like me and you don't have to get in a hurry today. God is going to have his way in our life if we'll just stay obedient and humble to him. So his word will always come true. And in verse 10, it said, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, for the children not yet even being born, nor having done any good thing or evil thing, uh, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, who calls us. Now, you got a lot of people today. The scripture said many are called, but few are chosen. God's the one. I, I'm going to tell you, I would not even want to walk in a pulpit if I wasn't genuinely called of God. He's the one who makes the election. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. That's what's wrong in a lot of churches today. You've got people, they never were called by God. All they did was went to school and got some kind of a license. And, and friend, I, we need the anointing. We need the anointing. Are there a lot of people that are anointing? There's a bunch of people that are anointing. And the anointings uh, come through many. Some have an anointing to teach. Some have an anointing to preach. Some have an anointing to work with small children and train them. Uh, when I think of this, one person in particular comes to my mind, Miss Henry's Murphy. When I was a little bitty boy, she had such patience and just the smile on her face and the love that she had. Us kids, she could have she could have got us to walk over hot coals because she was anointed to do what she was doing, to teach and to train little children. And and I can tell you, I was a youth pastor for a year and a half one time. And never, never, never again. And, and not only would I say that, probably the ones that I, that that I had taught, they would tell you he needs to be preaching to adults. He does not need to be teaching kids because I expected a lot out of those kids because I wanted them to be ready if something should happen and the Lord should call them home really quick. I wanted to make sure that their election, that they were sure of their salvation. But, you know, my calling was in pastoral. It was not in being an associate pastor, a youth pastor. These were stepping stones that God used to get me where I'm at. But, but you know, we want to walk, and there's, there's, there's God's will. You have his perfect will and his permissible will. If he knows you're seeking and you're really trying to find him and you had not figured out the plan yet, and you're not listening to him, even though you're trying to hear, you're not hearing for some reason, God will allow you to work in different areas, but when you get in the perfect will of God, you're going to bloom. You're going to flourish wherever God is using you, and that's the area that we want to be working in. Amen? Amen. So um, let's go back here. It says, God is the one. He's the one that makes the election. It's not of works, but of him who calls. And we know why God used Jacob rather than Esau. Esau didn't care anything about the firstborn, that, that, that birthright that he had. But Jacob, he sincerely, earnestly desired to have the blessings of God. And the Lord, he looked at that. He said, anybody that wants to be blessed that bad, and he allowed Jacob to have it. And uh, we, we know that later on, there was some things that had to, there was a meeting between them, and there had to be some forgiveness, and God healed. Amen. But let's look in verse 12. It said, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. That meant Esau would serve Jacob. And if you know anything about Jewish customs and Jewish rites, the right of the firstborn, it was, it was just set in stone. That meant Jacob, he was the one that was going to have that blessing. But you know, if we don't care anything about the ways of the Lord, he can take that blessing away and give it to another. And that's what happened. But it says the older will serve uh, the younger. 
This was in direct opposition of Jewish custom. It said, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. God didn't literally hate Esau's soul or his person. He hated the fact that Esau didn't care anything about the fact that he had blessed him. It was just, it was just an afterthought. That's what God hated, and he loved the fact that Jacob wanted the blessing. It says, what shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. And people say, well, how could you say if, that, if it was supposed to have been that Esau got the blessing, but God gave it to Jacob? How could you say that he was not unrighteous or unfair? Because God knows the outcome of all things. And he knew that this had to be for the lineage to come about for the 12 tribes of Israel to line up and be in his perfect will. God always knows What's best for us? Second Peter 1 and 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, uh, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. You want to make sure that you're saved and you are in his will at all times because today is the day of salvation. It says, For if you do these things, you will never stumble. It says, For so an interest will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you make sure you are right and in the will of God at all times and examine yourself, like Paul said, every day we need to examine ourselves. If you do that, you're going to buy yourself a one-way ticket right into the gates of glory because God is faithful, amen? And his promises are true and they're yes and amen. Second Thessalonians 2 and 3, it said, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And I can tell you, if you come to a church house on Sunday morning, even as we've been running in the 70s and 80s, and I'm proud of those numbers, but do you want to know what I really think? In the day we're living in and the disease that has hit our nation and the way that people don't love each other and don't care anymore and even families are being torn apart and divorce rates are higher than they've ever been, I think people ought to be flooding the church houses. Our sanctuaries ought to be packed and there ought to be people in the dining hall watching on televisions until we add on to our sanctuary. We, uh, we ought to see an overflow of people really knew where we were on God's timetable. But you know why? They don't sense it in their spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit, a lot of them. They don't have that, that sense of discernment that God gives to his people. I could preach there for a while. But it says, unless there comes a great falling away first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's referring to the Antichrist here. And, and you know, have you ever heard people say, he may already be on the earth. He just hadn't come on the scene yet. I believe that people could be absolutely uh, correct about that. I believe that the devil's already got things set in motion but I know this, God's plan, even though the devil's got a plan, God's plan is greater, and the Lord's going to win out, and in the end, we win. Amen? Amen. It said, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. What's restraining him, Brother Little? The Holy Spirit is restraining this spirit of the Antichrist right now. It says, for the mystery of lawlessness is at work, uh, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who will remove the Holy Spirit? It's not but one person. When the Lord gets ready, he's going to move him out of the way. He's going to rapture his people out of here. And if you think we're in chaos right now, you wait until the rapture takes place and God's people are gone and the Holy Spirit is not convicting people anymore. It's going to be chaos like they cannot imagine down here then. I wouldn't want to be here for that. And it said, Then the law, lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy. When does the Lord destroy him? With the brightness of his coming. Amen. It says, Hebrews 6 and 4 said, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the, and the powers of the age to come 
if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. See, uh, reprobates, once they're turned over to a reprobate mind, the Holy Spirit no longer deals with them. They are sealed. Their fate is sealed for eternity if the Holy Spirit's not convicting them anymore. And that's when they're given over to a reprobate mind. And the Bible says if they're reprobates, they will be damned. They will believe a lie. They will never have any hope again. And we don't want anybody that we know. We don't want to be there ourselves. We don't want our loved ones there, any of our friends, anybody. We don't want to see that happen to people. Amen? And it says... If, if they fall away, it's hard to renew them to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Romans 10 and 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, what a promise. Here's the key to the mansion. All you got to do is insert the key and turn the lock and open the door. What's the key? We believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth, and boom, we are saved. Amen? It says, for with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We are made again overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Let's go further here. Discussing the lesson, what is divine election? And this, this is talked about in Romans chapter 9, 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. It says the election in historical context. The subject of election as it applies to the Jews is based on those scriptures that say the Israelites, the Jews, are the elect or chosen people of God. His word said, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people who should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't it something that when he first came, he came only for the Jewish nation, but it says he was the stone that the builders rejected, and he said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles, and now we're grafted in. Now everybody can be saved. All we've got to do is accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, confess our sins, and boom, we all are heirs and joint heirs with Christ immediately. That's a wonderful thought to me. And it says, we're chosen people of God. And it says, they were chosen by God to fulfill a destiny. See, God, he doesn't, he doesn't just save you for no reason. When he saves you, he's got a purpose and a destiny for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, we quoted it last week. The Lord says, for I know the thoughts that I think concerning you. I want to prosper you give you a hope and a future. God wants to open doors up for you. It says to give us a destiny that would result in our salvation from sin and from occup and, and occupying the land of Canaan. That was the blessings that God wanted for the children of Israel. Giving the world the Bible, that's his word, and bringing into the world Jesus, the Messiah, to be the Savior of the world. All of those things are wonderful. If you know who Jesus is today, just like Peter, the Lord says, who do men say that I am? Well, some say. You know, a lot of people say a lot of things today. Some believe Jesus was just a good man. Others say, I don't even know if he was ever born or existed. But friend, let me tell you something. Peter knew who Jesus was, and I hope that you do. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus made a proclamation over him. He said, Simon Barjona, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. If you know who Jesus, I mean truly in your heart, you know who Jesus is, it's because God willed it to be so and he blessed you so you would have knowledge of who he is. And we need to give God praise for that every day if we're saved. It said the problem posed by election is in regard to those who are not elected. Following logic, this leads many to the conclusion that the unelected are predestined by God to be separated from God by sin and death forever. However, no scripture says that God has predestined anyone to be eternally lost. As a matter of fact, God's word says something totally contrary. And a lot of people, uh, there's a deceiving spirit in the earth, and there's some people teaching 
Some people are predestined to be lost and never to be saved. I don't believe God would be cruel enough to let somebody come in this world and be born with no hope at all of ever having salvation. And I can prove it to you in his word. The scripture said it's not God's will that any, A-N-Y, would perish. That means not even one, but that all would come to repentance. God wants relationship with you. Well, what makes the difference in people then? The difference is, is do they want relationship with God? You know, COVID has really been a revealer over the last year. We found out who was going to be faithful to the house of the Lord and who was not going to be faithful to the house of the Lord. People say, well, why ain't so-and-so coming to church? They're not coming to church because they don't want to come to church. Let me say that again. They're not coming to church because they don't want to come to church. Why? Anything else they want to do, they jump up and they go do it. But when it comes time to go be in God's house, they're nowhere to be found. So they are making a choice. And you know, don't we all make a choice? The Lord says, choose you this day whom you'll serve. That's what he said through Joshua's proclamation. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, I'm going to put it in action. It ain't just going to be lip service. We're going to serve God every day. Jesus said, I place before you two doors today, life and death. Choose, choose. It's our choice. Choose life is what Jesus said. So it's all in the choices that we make. Amen. Election uh, in Christian context. Believers in Jesus Christ are elected according to the foreknowledge of God by the Father, and this is a means of great salvation provided through Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, we are exhorted to give diligence to making our calling and election sure, for if we do this, we will not fall, but we will be granted an abundant entrance. Salvation is something that we want to be Dead sure. How you like that word? When I take that last breath, I want to be positively positive that I am saved and all of my sins are under the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Let's go further here. Why must our presentation... Well, well, I'm going to back up just a minute. It says here, let's look at this. It says, these two scriptures bring together God's role and our role in being God's elected or chosen people. The great Christian evangelist, uh, D.L. Moody, explained it this way. He said he was walking along the road of life when he came to a gate with a sign overhead that read, Whosoever will may enter in. So he passed through the gate, and when he went on his way, he looked back and he saw another sign above the gate that read, Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. How many does God choose? All of those who will choose him. If you make a step toward God, he'll make steps toward you. But if you reject God, he's going to reject you. If you don't accept Jesus as the son of God, automatically you have chosen to be doomed for eternity because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if you do not choose Jesus, you choose the other way. And God's heart is broken, I believe, every time a person makes that decision. Uh, it, it questions for application. Why must our pre- uh, presentation of the gospel be that anyone uh, who will may come to Christ and they can trust in him for salvation and be saved by his grace and be granted a place among the elect of God? Seeing that there is no scripture that teaches God has predestined anyone to be eternally lost, What should be our understanding of election? Uh, And again, I say this, if you choose God, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if we keep his commandments, we're going to gain entrance into heaven. Amen. Response to the word. God has given us the intellectual ability and the moral responsibility to make choices. When we choose to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, God chooses or elects or predestines us to inherit eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 and 23. The Lord is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. 
2 Peter 3 and 9. God does not take away freedom of choice, making it impossible for sinners to repent by predestinating them beforehand to be eternally lost. That would be a cruel God that did that. Uh, this would invalidate the gospel as God's offer of salvation to whoever would believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, whoever will may believe in Christ and be counted among the elect who gain everlasting. All you got to do is accept Jesus. I know that sounds simple, but if you accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and your Savior and you confess your sins and with your mouth you tell the whole world, this is my testimony, I'm a child of God, you're going to be saved. Amen? Let's go further here. Again, question for application. Do you consider it of crucial importance for us to know who or what is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed? If so, why? And if not, why? I say no because we, I don't really need to know what's holding the Antichrist. Now, I'm not worried about the spirit of the Antichrist. Why? Because we need to live every day as though it's our last day. Every night when I go to bed, I say, God, you know, I know I'm not perfect, but I did what I could, and I'm going to have to trust the rest of it to your grace and your mercy. Lord, I'm going to sleep here, and I trust you for my eternal salvation. When I get up in the morning, I get up thanking God for my family. I thank him for the food I have every day, every bite I have to eat. And if we live our lives in gratefulness to God and we read his word and we apply it to our heart, don't just be the hearer, be the doer of the word, and we trust in Jesus and he lives in our heart, we know that we have eternal salvation. Question for application. Why is it important to understand that so long as a person has his mind and heart set on defection from Christ, he will not repent? But this does not mean that he can never repent. You know, people make a choice every day not to serve the Lord, but every day the Lord is just like that father in the story of the prodigal son. He's looking down the road. He hopes, he's in anticipation that you will come home and repent. Even the people, and God knows he's an all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipotent God. He already knows, but mercy and grace compels him to always run after you and to seek after you. He's hoping that you'll make that change, that you'll turn around. It's while, uh, while the scriptures in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, and 10 and 26 were directed to Jews who defected from faith in Christ, how might they apply to any person who defects from faith in Christ today? It says in the word of God, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That means that you know who Jesus is. You know that you were saved. You know that you have an eternal home in heaven, but you look at the ways of the world and you choose the way of the world over the ways of God. When we do this, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's look at the call uh, to discipleship here for a minute. It says, no one who follows Christ uh, is perfect, but we should be sincere in our commitment to being a lifelong disciple of Christ and be serious about striving for, to, for perfection and completeness and maturity as a disciple of our Lord Jesus. This is in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And let's look at ministry in action for just a second. I want to read that, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, are you aware of a fellow Christian who is being severely tempted to abandon his or her faith in Christ? Pray for that person to be kept in faithfulness to Christ. Exercise whatever good influence. See, this is how we know influence is so important. Be careful who you spend your time around because if they're positive people, they're going to influence you positively. And if they're negative people, they're going to influence you toward negative things. But it says, Pray for that person to be kept in faithfulness to Christ. Exercise whatever good influence you may have on that person to encourage him or her to remain faithful in Christ. Church, we are too close to the end to turn back. Now, I love that song that the happy Goodman sang. Think about the words to that. I wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. I got to make it to heaven somehow. None of us have made it yet, but through faith and through hope in Jesus Christ, 
And through obedience, as we walk in his word, we know, like the scripture said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have given unto him until that appointed day. I have entrusted my eternal soul and salvation into the hands of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished at the cross. We just had the Easter season. Oh, what a loving Savior we have that he would pay such a price for you and me. I want to invite you, if you're watching this tonight, uh, if you see this in any way, if it touches you, you don't have to call me. You, you, you may never even darken the doors of my church. You're more than welcome. We invite you. But friend, I want to tell you something. If you see this and your heart's pricked and you go to lay down tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you. I want you to know this man, Jesus. He changed my life radically forever and he put my feet on the solid path. Now I'm on the rock. And you know what? It's a happy life. He came so we'd have life and freedom and happiness in abundance. I hope you find that tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son to us, God. I pray, God, you chose us even before the foundation of the world. I pray tonight, God, that people would choose you. Lord, that they would turn their life and their heart over to you and they would confess, they would repent of their sins, be radically changed and transformed. Your word says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that perfect and good and acceptable will of God. We pray that over you tonight. In Jesus' name, be blessed, church. Hmm?